Okay, I guess it's time to start. Um, all right, well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the Science Circle inviting me to give a talk about some of the activities I've been doing with students in Second Life. Um, my name's Kurt Winkleman. I am a chemistry professor at Florida Tech uh, down in uh, Melbourne, Florida, which is on the East Coast, um, halfway between uh, Miami and, and Jacksonville. Um, I, I have to say, most of the time I give this talk to a bunch of chemists, and uh, I have to explain what Second Life is. Uh, and so I'm pleased to be able to cut out those slides from this presentation. <laughs> so this uh, maybe we'll have more time to talk about some other stuff. Um, in if you have questions, please just uh, post them in the local chat, and I will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and so I'll try and uh, keep track of that um, as as we go along. But if if I miss your question, um, just remind me at the end, and I'll be happy to to scroll back and look at it. Um, so actually, I'm curious, are there any chemists here? Uh, um, all right, so hopefully, I'm not going to get too much into the chemistry. Um, oh, very cool. High school, excellent. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the chemistry, but uh, if I, if I, uh, you know, throw out some term that, that you're not familiar with, just let me know, and I'll be happy to explain it. Most of what I'm talking about really is the on the education uh, research side of things. Okay, so let's. Uh, well, let's let's. <laughs> Good question. What is chemistry? Uh, watch Breaking Bad. They they pretty much explain everything. Um, okay, so let's talk about the design and effectiveness of laboratory experiments in Second Life. Um, so I am, let's see, having, okay. Just having a little trouble getting the slides advanced. There we go. Um, so I want to first start with introducing my collaborator, Dr. Wendy Wendy Keeney Kinnicut, uh, who's Julia Traxabar in Second Life. She uh, actually is now retired, but she was a Texas A&M University faculty member uh, and the collaborator on this project. She has actually done a lot more work in Second Life students than I have. Um, and in fact, this project deals with her students, um, not actually not mine. Heck. Um, but she's a, she's a uh, chemical education researcher uh, who's uh, been very active in Second Life. Um, right. So, as you may or, or may not know, depending on, I guess, how how much um, experience you have or familiarity you have with educational uses of Second Life. Um, Second Life's already used in many disciplines, um, especially in nursing uh, and, and veterinary education. Um, however, at, when we started this project a few years ago, we found that there were no published accounts of chemistry lab experiments conducted in Second Life. Now, I know of people um, uh, in Second Life who actually do have students performing chemistry experiments, but there was nothing published at the time. Um, and, and actually, there's there's still not enough published um, in the education literature. Uh, so we, we wanted to really explore this and, and see whether or not we could we could actually do some fine measurable uh, changes in student learning by uh, doing experiments in Second Life. Um, Students learn as well in Second Life as they do in real world activities and they enjoy their virtual experiences. Um, there is, as far as science and engineering goes, there is a lot of content in Second Life. It's uh, more along the lines of, of providing a, a space for tutoring 
or um, you know displaying some some three dimensional objects. Um, now, for a virtual lab in Second Life, um, they offer some real advantages. One is there's obviously unlimited options for activities. Um, they students asynchronously. Um, there can be assessment that's done in real time so that instead of a student taking a quiz at the end of a lab to for us to determine whether they learned anything, we can just actually track their activity during the experiment, look at a, a database of st uh, stu what student uh, the student actions that they performed in the virtual lab, and then we can just you know from that determine whether they did the experiment correctly and whether they learned something. Um, now you can do a lot of that in say a, a virtual reality environment as well, um, but the advantage of Second Life is the the there's no special technology needed. Uh, there's a low cost of use. Schools have computer labs um, full of, of computers that often aren't used very much because now students have their own laptops. Um, and and so we always thought you know Second Life was kind of a special place in that um, you know it it was freely available and didn't require students to have a certain quality of phone or uh, uh, you know headsets or anything like that. Um, and of course there's a lot, you know, Second Life's been around a long time so it's a fairly stable uh, place to, to develop activities. Um, of course there is, the, there is the cost of developing those activities and, you know, the learning curve for users is, is uh, a little bit steep. So we have to address that whenever we introduce new students into, uh, into Second Life. Um, so as I said, there was no prior published evaluation of student learning or attitudes in for lab experiments conducted in Second Life, um, which replace real-world experiments. Um, in terms of virtual labs, there are uh, there are a lot of of, ex, of publications or published main uh, published articles talking about chemistry labs done in a virtual environment, augmenting or being like a pre-lab activity before going into the real lab. And of course, you know, virtual pre-lab activities are, are beneficial as well, but we really wanted to look at actually replacing chemistry experiments that were conducted in a real lab. So, um, Wendy and I uh, got together and we replaced two general chemistry two experiments at Texas A&M with Second Life versions. Now Gen Chem 2 is is a freshman class, um, you know, mostly first year students. Uh, it's obviously the second semester of a of introductory chemistry sequence. Now we did two experiments. Um, the first is what we call a titration uh, which is a, a very careful way of determining the concentration of some chemical in solution. In this case, uh, they had they, they already had a, a laboratory experiment developed where they tested the salinity or salt content of a water sample. Um, the The idea for that experiment was that these were water samples taken from an estuary in Texas, and so they were they were determining the the salt content. Um, they weren't actual water samples, but that was sort of the background lab. Um, and the second experiment was collecting gas over water to determine the molar mass. Um, molar mass is a, a a big idea in freshman chemistry, um, and so the uh, and so it and this is this technique is a is fairly common um so we found we 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 found two lab experiments that we could replace with second life versions um and the lab experiments were also ones that would be very common commonly performed, not just at texas a and m but at, at just about any other university um so we have some research questions. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I have to pause here. I'm having 
on my screen, these slides are not rendering very well. Um, is anybody else having trouble? I see. Okay. Oh, good. All right, great. Well, I'm not sure what... That's fine. I've got... I know what I'm talking about, so I don't need to see them. Um, so we have we have research questions. Um, we wanted to compare student performance in the, the Second Life lab experiment to their performance of the same experiment conducted in the real lab. So our four questions were, do they... How, how does this, this virtual experience affect their attitudes about chemistry, if at all? Um, how much do they learn? Um, and not just learning in terms of, of textbook content knowledge, uh, but also um, their, their hands-on skills. This, is, this third uh, research question addresses a very common concern, complaint, criticism, whatever, that, that I get from other chemists, and that is that you can't teach hands-on lab, uh, lab techniques in a virtual world, um, especially one like Second Life, where it's driven. Um, and I'm not sure that that's actually the case, but we wanted to we wanted to find out. Um, so we wanted to know if they can learn kinesthetic skills from the Second Life experiments, and you know, do they do they enjoy the the uh, do they enjoy the experiments as well? Because that's obviously important. Um, it's an important component of, of learning. So, um, we're going to first talk about developing and implementing these experiments. Um, and so the first thing we had to do was take our real-world experiments that we that we knew how to do and convert them into a Second Life uh, version, and so we had some programmers, uh, well, I'm sorry, before we could send anything to the programmers, we had to perform the experiments uh, and rewrite them in a way that non-chemist computer uh, programmers or software programmers could uh, understand, uh, so there was a little bit of translation involved there. Uh, we performed the experiments and recorded lots of video and images so that everything was scientifically accurate as possible um, and so we and and so we also wanted to take into account that students obviously you know they sometimes make mistakes in the lab and we wanted our experiments to incorporate those possibilities so we actually spent a lot of time making <laughs> making mistakes uh, intentionally and then you know, putting that into the, the program itself. Um, these particular lab experiments are, there, there's a fair amount of calculations that students would have to perform um, in, in order to, to, you might say, get the right answer or answer questions about the experiment. Um, and so a lot, of the, a lot of the outcomes of the students' actions um, can be mathematically modeled. Um, so if they add a certain number of grams of one chemical, then they're going to get a particular result. If they add a, a different amount of chemical or they wait a different amount of time for their chemical to react, that all plays into the outcome of the experiment, which is, which is mathematically modeled. Um, we use professional programmers, uh, and I'll, I'll actually they're included on the uh, acknowledgments. Uh, at the end, uh, so you'll, if you're interested in uh, finding out who did this work, uh, I'll be happy to share that. The developers had experience working with educators, which we found important um, because I, educators can be difficult to work with, um, and so they they had some, they they understood where we were coming from in terms of you know dealing with students and things like that. Um, so the developers were actually great. Um, we did run into some implementation challenges. Uh, there's a, a need for full support from the, the department, the, the academic department that, that's offering this, in our case, chemistry, and the IT department. Um, the, the, the students and lab instructor buy-in is also important. We found this out kind of the hard way. Um, 
you know, the students come in, especially these being freshmen, they come in with expectations about, uh, uh, it, the, the expectations about what college should be. And if you don't fulfill those expectations, um, they they can they can kind of get upset and you know that's when they start complaining whether things are too hard it's just different than they expect so we we really worked hard to sh explain to them that they were they were not just guinea pigs in this in this research experiment um, or this this research uh, project but you know that we were also trying to give them an experience uh, you know working in a virtual world this is you know something they're going to probably be down the road when they get in science or engineering, um, and so you know that that actually helped with getting them getting them on. Um, and obviously, we don't want to create work um, for them, and we want to provide the the training that they need. Um, yeah. I, okay. So there's um, some comments about <laughs> there's some comments about uh, you know, safety and, and how students experience, what they experience in the lab. And it's true, um, they can't smell chemicals, um, although we really don't encourage that anyway. Um, in a lot of cases, if, if they perform the experiment safely, they won't, shouldn't smell anything. Um, as far as holding, you know, a, a beaker in your hand and feeling it react, that's true. Um, you know, there's there's some things that we that we have to give up when we go to a, a virtual environment, but I think there's also going to be some advantages as well. Um, and yeah, the buy-in, uh, yeah, the the, the buy-in is is important. Um, but yeah, you're right. If if you have days when students can't meet in the lab, um, then a virtual lab is is really good. It also relieves some overcrowding from existing labs. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 I think they enjoy not having to worry about setting themselves on fire. Actually, that, that really was a, a serious, uh, I think, a, an important point that the students raised, actually, and so we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so our, our design of the live experiments, in part, was was guided by the existing lab environment. Um, on the left is a, a, an image of the Texas A&M chemistry lab in the real world, right up uh, overlapping with the virtual um, version of the lab. We wanted students to feel comfortable, like they recognized the virtual world they were entering into. Um, and, and so we wanted to make it as, as realistic as possible. The idea being that they, we wanted them to be immersed. Um, on the right is a picture of the the lab building, which turned out to be, um, in, it, it was not essential to the con, to them conducting the experiment, but it was essential for them to feel immersed when they would go to uh, when they would log in, and we we sent them the to teleport to teleport in this is where they would this this is where they, they would show up um, and and so then they'd have to walk into the the building they'd walk past a, a cafe and some offices that were empty but they look like faculty offices uh, and then they they'd go down a hallway it was set up like a real um, academic building um, and then they'd enter this virtual, uh, the, this chemistry lab, um, the actual experiments were conducted on lab platforms that were in the sky that they couldn't see from the ground. Um, but as far as their uh, you know, entering into the, the virtual world, we wanted to make it as realistic as possible. Um, Okay, um, so let's see. We okay. So when we designed the experiments, um, 
One of the challenges that we, I, we had two major challenges. Um, one was that in order, I mean, there's a lot of lab, lab equipment that students use that has very, very fine markings. Um, and, and so, you know, to read a thermometer, you, you, in a real world, you have to get, you know, fairly close to the thermometer to see all the little markings. Um, Second Life is, is limited in how much you can zoom in. So you can see on the, the picture on the right here um, that we have lab equipment like this balance and, and a tub of water um, that is significantly larger than the avatars. Um, and so that was just one way that we had to, one way we, we felt was, was necessary to make the equipment big enough for the students to easily use. Now, it seems kind of comical, and you know, it is kind of funny looking, um, but it really wasn't that big of a distraction because the students would often uh, zoom in and, and look at it from a, a really first person uh, point, and at that point, when they're just looking at the lab equipment, it all seemed relatively the right size. Um, <laughs> yeah, they shrunk themselves. Um, that's funny. So the other the other disadvantage is of of Second Life that we had to deal with was the um, you know a lot of it had to be menu driven, and we we would have liked to have more um, sort of free freedom for the students to to do things but um, often as you can see here you know they would click on an object and they would get a series of options um, of things they could uh, things they could do with that object um, and you know there's only you know often there's only a lot of there's only a limited number of things you can do with an object so so the list was fairly um, comprehensive but still um, it, it took away from some, from some of the realism um, but we did have some advantages of doing things in, in Second Life that took away from the realism, but that was a benefit. Like this little button down here is a reset button. In the middle of their experiment, if they messed up, they just click that. Everything goes back to where it started, and they can start over. In a real lab, they would spend 15 minutes cleaning things, getting things rearranged and back in order. Um, and that's kind of a waste of time, we felt like. If, if they want to start over, Let's give them as much time as, as they can to uh, to actually do the experiment. Um, and of course, there's chat, and so that was nice. The students, um, some of them use headphones, some of them use local chat, um, so that they were able to communicate. They didn't actually have to be sitting next to each other. Um, and as the as the picture on the right points out, these were these students were working with lab partners, um, which is an important part of of chemistry lab experiments or experiments in general, um, you know, learning is a social activity. And so uh, we wanted them to, to be social in the virtual world. And we, we found that, in fact, they really did kind of behave the same way in the virtual world. All right, so um, let's see. And I have other things. Um, other things we did to help them was that you can't really see it. It's kind of in the back here, um, but there is a, a a button to call for help. Um, the picture on the right is from the viewpoint of one of our um, one of the teaching assistants. What you see here at the at the the bottom is a heads up display which allows the instructor to teleport to any lab platform um, immediately. So when the student clicks the, the call button, you might say, which is, which is up here, um, then the, one of these buttons lights up and the instructor can teleport there and talk with the students, just like if they raise their hand in a classroom. Um, we also had a feature where, and, and this, is, this is Wendy, um, back behind our, our one-way mirror, the back of the lab area was a one-way one wall, uh, or window, I guess. So we could stand 
behind that and we could view the students doing their lab experiment, they wouldn't see us and that enabled us to really kind of kind of watch them without them feeling like we were watching them. Um, you know, we wanted the students to be able to do their work. Um, but we, we also wanted to, to be able to, to monitor what they were doing. And of course, with the oversized lab equipment, they could zoom in and see some of the details um, for some of the uh, for some of the equipment. I'm trying to read some of that uh, some of the, the chat here as well. Um, Yes. Okay. So, um, wanting to see explosions. So, um, we when we started this project, we really we had to think about what type of experiments we wanted them to do. It, in our case, um, we chose these experiments because they were ones that were being done at Texas A&M at that time, um, and we wanted to have a, a good comparison. If if we weren't conducting the research study, uh, we would just create the most fantastic um, type of experiments that you know would be entertaining and educational, but also unusual and things that they can't do in a real lab. Um, so you know, yeah, doing things, fix you know, thing, working with things that could explode would be really fun and uh, you know can be educational too. Um, it, you know, because of the research design, we uh, we actually had to we had to tone it down <laughs> and make the experiments kind of kind of normal. Um, okay, so uh, our experiment features um, we tried to emulate real life um, as much as possible. Uh, well, to some extent, um, you know, we, we made these are the choices we we were allowed to make by designing the virtual experiments is how realistic we wanted. Um, you know, measuring things are not always exact in a chemistry lab, and, and we did want students to have that um, that experience. So, dispensing chemicals, you know, if they wanted a certain volume of, of solutions, they would have to, you know, they'd have to be very careful in how they dispensed it. It was automatically appear. Um, there was always some random error. Uh, we could have had a pre-lab experiment, I'm sorry, a pre-lab quiz in Second Life, um, but we, we chose not to, again, to make it as, as equivalent to the real world as possible. The students did their quizzes on paper. Um, and as I said before, students make mistakes um, and that affects their results. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, that's an interesting idea that that um, the virtual experiments encourage them to encourage people to do the real thing. Um, hadn't thought about that. Okay. Um, so when we had developed the experiments and then we implemented them, we had students. Um, perform a, a pre-lab, some pre-lab activities. If they were in the virtual um, lab group, they viewed some tutorials, they created an avatar, and they did some mandatory um, training. Um, we, at first the training was uh, was optional, but we realized pretty quick that they, they needed to have some basic understanding about how to walk around and manipulate things in uh, in Second Life. So the training was turned into something that was mandatory. Um, so they did all that the week before they started the first Second Life experiment. Um, they met in the uh, computer lab to do the uh, Second Life experiment. So they were all meeting as a group, just like they would meet as a group for the regular class. Um, they worked with a lab partner and the, uh, the we had a, a, a lab instructor, a TA there, um, as usual. The TA was in the room, but also in-world. Okay. Um, so, 
again, our four research questions, um, we had a control group, we had a, a virtual lab group, and so we were able to compare outcomes of the two for each of these four research questions. Um, for our assessments, we use what's called the Attitudes Towards Subject of Chemistry uh, survey, which is a, a well-known survey for attitudes about chemistry, uh, pre-post lab quizzes and lab report grades, measured content knowledge. Uh, we had a lab practicum where for the experiment where they collected gas over water, um, they had to actually assemble uh, half a dozen little things together to in order to take a measurement or, or collect some data. Um, so we performed the, the lab practicum and then we had uh, opinion surveys um, after activities were complete to uh, to get their attitudes about the virtual experience itself. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a general chemistry two course. Um, the lecture class was separate from the lab class, so um, that didn't have as that didn't have much of an effect on uh, what they did. In, the lecture didn't have much effect on what they did in the lab. Um, they were randomly assigned to the two groups, and the teaching assistants, the, the lab instructors, were also randomly assigned, but each teaching assistant um, taught one second life group and one control group as well. Um, we had about 140 students in each of the, each of the, the groups. Um, Okay, our population, as I say, this is a, a first year course for, for most students. Um, they were similar in, in just about every respect that we measured. Um, typical, uh, you know, young college age, mostly female, Caucasian, um, and the vast majority were in science, um, engineering, agriculture, vet, or sorry, veterinary science. Um, so we had a, 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 what I would say is a fairly typical um, traditional group of college students, um, at least for a, a large uh, public um, university in the U.S. Okay, so uh, we started, we'll start with the student attitudes. Um, the ASCII survey covers the subject of, of chemistry in general, not just their attitudes about the lab, although that is a part of it. Um, it's 20 survey questions asking them about um, anxiety, interest, emotional, I'm sorry, em emotional satisfaction, intellectual accessibility, things like that. Um, it's a, it's a, it's like a, what they call a Likert survey. Um, so the students get two, there's two statements, one on the left, one on the right. One says, I like chemistry. The other, on the other side says, I don't like chemistry. And then the students choose on that, on a seven point scale, which, where their answer lies on that continuum. Um, in fa <laughs> we didn't see much effect of the virtual labs, really of any of the labs, on student uh, attitudes. Their initial attitudes were typical compared to what's reported in the literature for other uh, large chemistry classes. Um, both groups showed similar pre and post scores on this survey. Um, meaning that neither the real world labs or the virtual labs had much of any impact. Uh, and there was also no impact on, uh, uh, or no effect of gender on, on the outcomes. Um, so I, guess I, sh I should mention the students, um, you know, they performed these two virtual experiments, but that was among a, a group of like 12 experiments that they, they performed throughout the semester. So they had two weeks in Second Life and then they had two, uh, 10 weeks in the, the regular lab, um, the control group did all 12 uh, real-world experiments. Okay, um, so then ah, okay, sorry, I get my slides out of order here. Um, so content knowledge gains. This is where we did start to see some some impact uh, of Second Life. Um, of course, both we would expect, and and we were pleased to see that both groups learned something during their respective lab experiments. Um, so the the 
the, ex the quizzes they took at the end of lab showed that they had learned something compared to their initial scores on the pre-lab quizzes. Um, but on one of the quizzes, the Second Life group made even greater gains, um, uh, on, like, uh, and then they made equivalent gains on the other quiz. Um, the, the quizzes were multiple choice randomized questions, um, but basically covered the same content. Um, the Second Life group performed better on lab reports um, using you know, the same rubrics. Now the, the lab report results were interesting because students wrote the lab reports throughout the week, mostly probably the night before they were due. Um, they wrote their lab reports outside of Second Life. So even the, you know, the students might have spent a couple hours in Second Life doing their virtual experiment, but the data they collected there was of higher quality, um, so to speak, and so that helped them write a better lab report. Um, they, they perhaps understood what they were doing a little better in the Second Life experiment so that they could write a better lab experiment. Um, and both groups uh, achieved similar results for the other lab report. Um, and I, just to remind you, we had the, the grading was done by TAs that supervised each uh, one, one class of students in each group. Um, so the same TA was grading a control group and a, a, uh, a second life group. Okay, um, so now, laboratory practicum. This is what, personally, this is the part I was most interested in um, because I, I, I took a lot of heat from colleagues about students not being able to learn hands-on skills. So, well, one of the experiments involved them uh, collecting gas over water. The gas was actually butane, um, and you can see uh, the butane is on the uh, in the cigarette lighter. The idea here is that they, they weigh the lighter before and after the experiment. Um, they release some of the butane during the experiment and so they get a change in, in the weight of, uh, of the lighter. Um, the butane goes from the cigarette lighter through a piece of tubing that you can see here, up into uh, a, a, a cylinder, what we call a graduated cylinder, that has been immersed in this tub of water and filled with water and then held uh, upside down. So as the butane goes into the graduated cylinder, it displaces some water. And so they get a volume of butane collected in the graduated cylinder. They know the mass of butane based on the, the, the change in mass of the lighter that they recorded. Um, and from that, they can, they can do the calculations to figure out the molar mass of butane. This is kind of a standard gen, uh, chemistry experiment. Um, but to, to actually do this experiment, they have to connect some tubing. They've got to put the graduated cylinder into the bucket of water. They have to burst the graduated cylinder so that, or they have to fill the graduated cylinder with water. They have to invert it. They have to put tubing up into it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a multi-step assembly process in order for them to, uh, in order for them to, to actually gather a single data point. Okay. Um, so, what did we find? Well, we looked for the laboratory practicum. We looked at several steps. Now, we performed the practicum the following week after they, after everybody did the, the lab experiment where they collected gas over water. The next week, we had them come in. It, while they were doing uh, the next experiment that week, uh, we called up each student individually. So while they worked as a team, as a pair of students, during the actual experiment, um, we called them up to do the practicum individually. We looked at the overall practicum score, but that overall practicum score was a, was a combination of being able to connect the tubing, 
arrange the cylinder, collect the gas, adjust the height of the cylinder, um, which is a I forgot to mention, but they have to they have to adjust the height or position of the graduated cylinder after they put butane gas into it, so that the water level inside and outside of the the tube are the same. It's a, a, an actually an important point in terms of the chemistry, um, but it's just a, a a detail that they had to to uh, they had to perform in order to get the the, the correct answer. Um, they had to read the the volume of an upside down graduated cylinder, which is you know not necessarily as as it sounds. Um, they had to record that volume. Um, they had to write the number the correct way. Significant figures started, um, and then. A part that all, all of those items were part of the overall uh, practicum score. We also asked them, "How confident are you in your measurement? Do you think your measurement? Did do you think you did this correctly?" Um, and so, okay, so some of the results. Most of the results actually show within um, uh, within a, a 95 degree, uh, 95 uh, percent confidence. The results were the same. The overall score between the control and experimental groups, the, the students doing the real world lab and the students doing the virtual lab, were the same. They, they were able to do these hands-on skills just as much overall. Um, and some of the skills, like connecting the tubing um, or collecting the gas, they, they did do equally. But there were some notable differences. Um, so arranging the cylinder, the control group did a better job. Actually positioning the cylinder, the graduated cylinder in the tub of water, they did that better. But the second life group um, recorded the volume better. So overall, they got the same score, but they second life, in some cases, gave them help them learn skills better. In other cases, not as well as the real world. But what was, I think, most interesting is the degree of confidence that the students had. The Second Life group were less confident um, performing the practicum in the real world. So that kind of points to a, a, maybe a challenge for educators who design virtual experiences that students can, they can learn just as much. Obviously, they learn just as much. We, we saw that in the, the previous slides. Um, did just as well in the lab quizzes, if not better. But they may not feel as though they learned as much simply because of you know a, a bias against uh, a virtual experience versus the real world experience. Um, and and we've we've actually seen this in a, in a pilot study I did with some high school students as well. So it's it's um it's not unique to this particular. To, to this particular project. Okay, sorry, just trying to, to keep up with the, the chat. Um, okay, so, oops, there we go. Okay, so um, the last research question was about their um, opinions. So the stu all the students in both groups answered a 10-question survey about their real-world experiment experience, you know, what they did in the real-world lab. Um, all the students did at least 10 experiments in the real-world lab. Um, again, it was a, a, a what we call a semantic differential survey. Um, you know, two questions: I liked chemistry lab. I did not like labs um, and it was a five point scale between those two um, they both had similar both groups had similar views of their their real world lab experience um, in terms of how difficult the experiments were how enjoyable the time and effort and how much critical thinking were required all that was both groups had that the same experience which was good um, then the second life group took a a second uh, survey it was the same survey, except we swapped out real-world experiments with Second Life experiments. Um, and the Second Life group said they really liked the Second Life experiments. They thought they were fun. Um, they did say the, exper the uh, procedures were easy to perform. And I think, and then 
later on we asked them some follow-up questions and that was it was basically because it was menu driven and they were able to just click things as opposed to you know picking up an object in the lab and wondering you know what do i do with it um the the menu driven procedures sort of focused them on you know what they had to do um but despite that they thought that the experiment still required uh critical thinking and um and you know, once they had their data from the experiment, they still had to analyze it the, the exact same way. The experiments in Second Life didn't spit out an answer for them, just it allowed them to record a measurement in their, their lab notebook. Um, so analyzing the data, writing the lab reports, that was the same experiment, experience. We then asked them to uh, compare the real world and Second Life exp uh, experiments. Um, they 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 said that the second life experiments took less time um that interestingly wasn't the case the second life experiments took just as long um but the students were i think more they, they used their time more productively um they weren't waiting around um, in the lab experiment, in the lab room, um, you know, trying to find pieces of equipment. Um, it, everything in the Second Life lab was sort of laid out for them. And so it was sort of a very straight, I think a more straightforward experience for the student. In the virtual lab, they saw all the equipment they need. It was all there. They didn't have, they weren't distracted by other students. Um, where do I find this chemical and so forth? Um, they thought the lab ex reports were easier to write simply because they, they felt like they had better data. Um, they, they thought each type required the same amount of critical thinking in terms of, of getting the right answers. Um, and although they liked the Second Life experiments um, and, and saw the advantages, they did not necessarily want exclusively Second Life experiments in the future. They really um, they really wanted a mixture, which I, I thought was kind of a, a, I don't know, maybe a mature response, um, even though they, they thought there, the, there were some nice features about the, the Second Life. They didn't want to give up the, the real world experience. Um, so we asked them in some focus group, uh, in some focus groups, to give us more information about how they felt about Second Life. They said it was less stressful. Being in a virtual, as chemists and educators, you know, we're very comfortable doing the, the learning activities and being in that learning environment. The students can find it very stressful, um, and we some, I sometimes forget about that. So being able to do a chemistry experiment in a virtual lab, um, they don't have to worry about safety. They don't have to worry about spilling things and all their peers looking at them like, Butts. Um, they don't have to worry about breaking stuff and having to pay for the lab equipment. You know, I mean, we we charge students if they break a beaker, you know, it's a couple of bucks. Um, so, you know, they don't they don't have to worry about dealing with actual chemicals. Um, now, maybe you want them to gain those skills, and certainly if they're a chemistry major, they should gain those skills. They should they should overcome their you know. Uh, apprehension about being in the lab but we have a lot of students who just take one semester of uh, or one or two semesters of, of chemistry do they need to worry about that hmm, I don't know maybe I think it's, it's a question that educators have to ask themselves but a virtual environment can eliminate some of that stress um, the lab exp, uh, exp, uh, the lab environment is less distracting in second life it's more organized Again, they don't have to wait around and um, to, to, to get their chemicals and things like that. And they did, uh, again, as I mentioned, the procedures being menu driven was they felt that was a, a big help. Okay. We also had a focus group for just the, the teaching assistants, the lab instructors. Um, and this was also some surprising uh, res uh, feedback we got from them. Initially, because we didn't do a good job of getting buy-in from them, they felt like they were on the verge of being replaced. 
Um, and so they they were initially very much against our Second Life lab experiments. Um, we realized that we had to reassure them that that was certainly not our intention, um, or it really wasn't even going to be possible that they could ever be replaced, but they didn't know that. Um, they did say that the Second Life exper experiments were better when the labs were overcrowded and there was insufficient equipment, um, so students had to, sh you know, even lab pairs, uh, uh, lab partners had to share equipment with other lab partners um, in other groups, and that was that can be kind of a hassle. Um, and although the students s cited the the fact that in Second Life you don't have to wait around in line to get stuff, and that's true, the students thought that was an advantage. The TAs actually pointed out that these students actually can learn stuff while they're waiting in line. They talk to each other. So as they're waiting in line, they ask, you know, how did you do that part of the experiment? Or, you know, they, they, would, they would ask each other questions so that they could better understand what they were doing. If you take away that, that time that they're forced to wait in line, then you take away that opportunity um, for them to, to chat with each other. Um, so we thought that was actually a, an interesting, interesting point. Um, it's kind of a, a making the lab experience more efficient is sort of a double-edged sword. Um, okay, so uh, overall the outcomes, they had some similar attitudes about chemistry at the end of the semester. Um, they, the Second Life group, slightly outperformed the control group, but they at least did as well um, on the two experiments. They performed the practicum equally well, but there were different aspects of the practicum that each group did better than the other. And the real world group had a greater confidence in their ability. Um, both groups had similar views about the, the real world experiments. The Second Life group thought the, ex, the Second Life experiments were a little easier because of the menus. Um, they liked them more than the, the real world experiments, but they really wanted a, uh, they would prefer a mix of the two. So what did we learn? Um, I think from this we were, we were confident Second Life experiments are effective substitutes for real world experiments. They learn just as much. They gain the, the kinesthetic skills. They have favorable, favorable attitudes about their experience in, the, in Second Life. Um, yeah, educators who have worked in Second Life already know training is, is mandatory, um, but we need to be cognizant of the feelings of the, the graduate students. If, if we have graduate students um, or other colleagues who are teaching the labs, we don't want them to feel threatened by uh, phased out by, by a, a virtual environment. Um, the, the students felt like the experiments were, were shorter, but they actually weren't, and they can gain. There's some benefit to having them wait around and chat with each other. Um, so this last slide, I think this is my last slide, um, is one that I share with, um, like I say, mostly chemists who, who aren't familiar with Second Life, um, you know, some of the advantages of, of virtual worlds in lab education, um, and I'm sure a lot of you already know this, um, but I always like to point out that, you know, when NASA and all the, the, uh, the airlines, the military, and medical schools all currently use lots of virtual education. Maybe, just maybe, if our astronauts and military and doctors and, and airline pilots, if they can learn their trade by in a virtual environment, maybe it's OK that our freshmen learn a little bit of chemistry in a virtual environment. Um, in a real world lab, students learn less than we think. Um, and that reminds me, I, with the practicum, all the students did the practicum individually. When we called up some of the students who had done the experiment in the real world, 
they told us they didn't know how to do it. I said, well, of course you know how to do it. You did it last week. And they said, oh, no, I didn't do that. I didn't assemble anything. I was in charge of recording the data. My lab partner did all the assembly. So even in a real, you know, in a real world environment where the students have an opportunity to gain hands-on experience manipulating lab equipment, they don't always take advantage of it. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they still might not learn those, those uh, real world skills that we want them to. Um, and of course, virtual worlds provide access to, um, can provide access to a quality lab experience um, for online students, mostly who are, most of them are female, deployed military, um, students with disabilities, and students in underfunded schools. Um, let's see, and, ah, my last slide is acknowledgments. Um, my two developers were Zandy Mars and Random Cole, um, and so I would highly recommend them um, want some really high quality development of student activities. Uh, my co-PI on this, uh, Dr. Wendy Ene Kinnicutt, um, our assessment team at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, Lenny Burness was an undergrad at the time who helped um, I, it was fun to be able to tell a student, hey, go into the lab, do these experiments, and make all the mistakes you can. Just record what the results are so that we can send it to the, to the uh, developers. Um, and then we had some NSF funding for this. And I thank you for, <laughs> yeah, go Aggies. Um, yeah, so I want to thank you for your time, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. And I, I'm sorry if I missed any in the chat. Um, you guys were very active, so I um, couldn't keep up with everything. But uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so let's see, how much resistance did I get from students? Um, and yes, we did. We did force them in. Um, if if a student had a, a real problem, um, I mean, if they just had a I don't know ideological objection to doing a virtual lab, we would have let them switch to a real world lab section. Um, but we didn't necessarily advertise that opportunity, so we uh, you know we just. They they didn't complain. The the students really didn't complain a whole lot. Um, trying to think if there was any. Yeah, I, I think it, because it was because it was only a a two week um, set of activities. They didn't, uh, you know, and 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 they were still they were still graded the exact same way. So they didn't. Um, I guess they they weren't required to do a whole lot of extra work and they were still graded in the the traditional way with a lab quiz and and lab report um we i actually i, I was asked uh earlier about doing like a field trip and that's something that we can arrange um the the our our location it was posted in the the local chat um to be honest i'm not that will take you to um, what's called Twelfth Man Island, which is one of the uh, um, one of the islands that that uh, Texas A and M and and that that Wendy actually still maintains. Half of it is her island, um, and half of it is ours that we use for this project. I don't know if I think we had to whitelist people to get we had to whitelist the students to get into. Um, to get into the the Second Life lab, just so we didn't have any grieving um, problems. I'm not sure if that's still in place. So if if you if you want to go there and, and check it out, by all means, you know, try it. Um, but uh, if you, you may you may have some some trouble getting in. If not, uh, if you do have problems, um, let me know and and I can I can show you around. Or I think we're going to organize a field trip here pretty soon. Uh, let's see. 
Let me. I'm trying to scroll up here. Um, okay. So let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, there are. I um. Let's see. Texas A and M. Th they no longer offer the virtual lab experiments um, to their students. And if, like I say, at Florida Tech, we have a, a, a traditional um, chemistry lab um, for where all the labs are done in, the, in a real world environment. Um, there are some schools that do completely virtual labs. Um, I know UCF does completely virtual um, biology labs. In, in, I think they're in Second Life. Um, and there's a school in Alaska, Prince William, Prince William Sound Community College, or Prince William Sound College, I think it is now. Their chemistry lab is completely done in Second Life. Um, again, it's, it's, you know, the advantage, well, I mean, it, it has advantages, um, and the, the downside, I, well, I'm going to say the downside. There are advantages, obviously advantages to doing it in a um, and the, I guess the, there's, they don't have a concern that their chemistry majors aren't getting a, a full lab experience. Because if you're a chemistry major, you're doing lab classes for four years. If one of your lab classes is virtual, it's not going to make, probably not going to make a whole lot of difference. Um, so that was kind of a long-winded answer. Um, this this is the o Second Life is the only environment that we've looked at. Um, we are in the process of well, we're we're actually searching for funding to develop some more lab experiments that we are going to develop in Unity. That way, they can be. Um, students can engage with them on a, a, a desktop computer, just like they do with Second Life, or in a, a like a VR headset. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as being used for math, I'm not I'm not sure what. I'm sure people do. I mean, there, there'd be a lot of actually neat things you could do with showing graphs and. Um, things like that in in mathematics, um, and I know like Wendy has done a lot of work with um, students learning mm, structures of molecules, which are three dimensional. You know, she shows them three dimensional models in Second Life, and that really helps. Um, and she also conducts tutoring and office hours in in Second Life. Um, so yeah, it is. I think it is very effective. Uh, let's see. How much time do you have? Um, we well, we ha the question is how much time did we have to um have to to develop the experiments? It's hard. It's hard for me to say because we we gave the developers like a a full academic year, and that was just based on the scheduling of when we got the funding, which was at the end of the summer. Um, we told them you know have the stuff ready in 12 months and they had it done you know by the summer and we we pilot we we beta tested it ourselves during the summer we probably could have gotten away with it getting done in maybe half that amount of time um but to be honest I'm not really sure I don't think developers were working full time just on our project so had they worked full time I'm sure they could have could have been done in a few months Um, I'm, okay, the question is, what are some other successful uses of Second Life for a real-world university, um, education, especially in humanities and social sciences? There, there are a lot of, um, I, I, off the top of my head, I'm not aware of, of specific people or, or schools, but I think there's, it's more commonly used in humanities and social sciences. Um, because you can send students to 
say, a, a historical time period, and they can, you know, go into a region of Second Life where developed a, a you know, 17th century France um, a island, and, and students can walk around and, and chat with people, see the architecture, you know, and, and learn about that time period in of environment. Um, and I know there's also a lot of, there's some interesting uses uh, for Second Life in uh, in psychology. I, I've, again, I don't know who, but the, the neatest one I've heard of is to help help people understand what somebody with um, like a schizo with schizophrenia experiences. Um, they go in, in, in Second Life, a person actually see things as somebody would see them if they had schizophrenia and, and, and other uh, problems like that. Um, and so it kind of helps people relate and understand what, what some people go through um, in a little bit better way. All right, um, let's see. Biology and astronomy. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I didn't know some of this. Uh, I didn't know about, yeah, biology I was aware of. Um, I didn't know about astronomy. That's interesting uh, being available. Uh, okay, so I think if, if anybody has more questions, I'm happy to um, hang around and chat. And like I say, we'll try and organize a... Uh, a field trip. This is exciting. Um, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you again. Thank you for everybody for uh, for coming and and thanks to Science Circle for inviting me. This has been this has been a lot of fun. Um, somebody asked about laser pointers. The the screen that I got from that I'm using has a laser pointer built in that seems to work at least for me um, pretty well.
Let me look up what screen this is. It's slide presentation screen version 7.1. Oh, yeah, thank you. That would be great. Um, would love to. Well, I don't know if I really want to see myself talk, but <laughs> it'll be it'll be neat to to share with other people. OK, well, take care, everyone, and uh, I will. I will see you around. Oh, I probably want to take this down. Let me... Hey, Kurt, um, I sent oh. you a bunch of stuff in um, IMs. Uh, I think we're doing some amazing work. If we could talk sometime, let me know. I sent you my yeah. email and real life information. But I think we're we're doing some similar sort of things. Oh, really? Oh, great. Yeah. Check, okay. Uh, Definitely. Check I'll, I'll be in Miami. touch. Take care. Awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye.